Hello everyone, this is a video lecture for Linear Algebra, Introduction to Proofs. What I'm wanting to do here is do two proofs with, with you, and they're going to be um, kind of basic. One of them has nothing to do with this class, but I think it's nice to kind of just get used to what proofs would look like and notation and stuff. And then the next one is from this class, but it's far later, I think in Chapter 5 or so, so it's quite a ways out. So let's get started. Um, first off, prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. Prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. So what does it mean to have um, irrational, rational, and all that kind of stuff? Let's go through uh, what to do, what we'll, we're, what we're talking about, and then we can jump into the proof here in a little bit. So first off, what is the square root of 2? It's basically about 1.4, uh, 1.4, moving on, 1.4, 1.4. And it goes on forever. Irrational means it goes on forever, okay? So we're saying, yes, does that decimal keep going forever and ever? There's no repeats, and yes. Um, this is kind of like saying pi is 3.14 and moves on forever. And then also E, 2.717, uh, moves on forever. Same kind of thing, okay? So we're saying that square root of 2 is in the same class as pi and E, essentially. Um, so how do we prove all this? What, what's going on? Well, let me get started with where irrationals are in relation to rationals and uh, integers. So often what we'd use uh, to display this stuff is we got integers. That's a Z with a little line that's indicating integers. And integers are negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 0, 1, 2, and 3, all that kind of stuff. So that's integers. Um, around that would be the rationals. And so the rationals, we use a Q with a little line in it. That's rationals. Again, rational numbers are ratios, one half, three quarters, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let me just give you some of those examples there. Those are easy. Um, what if we had, I'm just making something up here, uh, six halves, let's say. Well, this is three. This is an integer. And so some of these rationals are actually also integers. Okay. Uh, but then there's others that are not integers. So like one half would be somewhere like right here, but six halves would be somewhere like right there because it actually reduces down to be an integer. Okay, let me get rid of these little examples here. And then finally on the far outside, we have the real numbers. Okay, the real numbers. So that's an R with a little line there. Again, real numbers are any kind of decimal numbers uh, that you can think of. Uh, but notice that, again, real numbers can include integers. They can also include the rationals. Or they could also have this other stuff on the outside here, all this zone, I guess you could say. Uh, that would be, and more mathematically speaking, it's the real numbers without the rational numbers. Okay, So that backwards line right there, that backwards slash means without. So without the rationals, we got this uh, irrationals is what this would be now irrationals. They're still numbers, but they're not rational. Okay. Uh, and so that's where all three of these would fall in is this kind of outer zone, not inside here. What we're going to do to prove this to be irrational somewhere in this zone is that I'm going to say it's not on the inside. So I'm going to say square root of two is not right here. Therefore, it has to be inside right there. Okay. Uh, some things, I, I, I don't want to go into too many proofy little technicals, but we can see that this is not an integer, okay? We can see that. Uh, if you want to go and prove that it's not an integer, that, I guess that's another way, but I think we could probably solve that also here in this proof. Also, um, there's another one that's further out than all this is the complex numbers, which are, uh, you know, like I's, imaginaries, and all that kind of stuff. Again, though, it doesn't have an I or anything like that. I'm not really focusing on that with this proof. Again, we might just prove that without having to talk about it, uh, but we're not going that far, okay? We're just saying, hey, it's not in this zone, therefore it should be in that zone. That's my, that's my goal here. 
And so I'm going to start by saying uh, to prove this. So this is my proof on this side here, the words, okay? To prove this, I'm going to, uh, I will use a proof by contradiction. A proof by contradiction. Now you don't, I don't think you necessarily need to be saying this ahead of time, um, but it is a good thing to do. That way I'm understanding exactly where you're going. Uh, so you're saying it in clarity. Like if you were to do some other kind of symbols and talk about it in a different way, I could probably understand that. But I'm going to say this is probably best to go ahead and be very clear. Say I want to do this by proof of contradiction. And so I'm going to make a contradiction up, and then we're going to disprove it essentially. So I'm going to assume that the square root of 2 is an element of the rationals. Now that little E thing, that's a C with a little line in the middle. Um, and that looks like an E, basically. That's element of, element of the rationals, okay? And so I'm assuming this. This is not what I wanted. Uh, this is the, this is going to be proven false here in just a minute. So let's keep going. Uh, if the square root of 2 is indeed an element of the rationals, a little line there, uh, then I can... Uh, give you a statement such as the square root of 2 is equal to p over q. Now, by rational, again, we mean ratio, which, again, I had given you examples, one half, three quarters, and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm saying that there's a ratio of numbers if it's rational. If it's indeed rational, it should have a ratio, one half, three quarters, all that kind of stuff. Um, but now I want to, I just made P and Q up, I just made them up. So I got to tell you what they are and how they come from and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, I'm going to say such that, such that P and Q are elements of the integers. So they're basically they're integers. Um, you don't have to say such that. In fact, you could just leave that out. I, I will sometimes, uh, you can use, like ST is another way to do it really quickly. Again, I'm just teaching you notation here about proofs. This has nothing to do with linear algebra, but it is a nice proof, and it's easy, and we can talk about it, okay? Um, so again, I'm defining P and Q. You could have said A and B. You could say whatever you want, but P and Q is kind of a typical one in this particular definition of rationals. It's something that I was taught and something I'm teaching you here. Uh, and I'm saying that these are both integers, okay? Now, one thing to keep in mind is that whenever I'm writing something like three quarters, that is a reduced fraction. That's a reduced rational expression. Um, I guess we could have said it was six eighths, but we're not going there. We're wanting to keep it uh, most simplified. So we're always wanting to go back to the most simplified version to display what the actual results would be, okay? To keep that in mind, to keep that in your in your mind here. I'm going to write that in the proof, okay? I don't think you need this necessarily, but it's a very good idea to keep us straight, okay? So I'm going to state that uh, also P and Q uh, are in the lowest terms. That's kind of what I'm saying right there. Um, so each have no common factors. Okay, here we go. Again, my proof is basically right here. <laughs> All this stuff. This is just examples. You would not be putting any of this on your proof papers, okay? None of this needs to be there. If you want to just dabble on the side and, you know, talk about it, that might be helpful, but it's not, it's not actually going to give you any points or bonuses or anything like that. This has nothing to do with the problem. This is actually what your proof is. Okay, so I'm saying they're in the lowest terms. Uh, again, they don't have any common factors. Okay, cool. So we've stated everything we need to do. Awesome. Let's continue on with this. So I'm saying now, um, if we have this P over Q business, and I'm going to use a little arrow action to say like, okay, well, the next step mathematically would be, well, I'm going to square both sides so that we get P squared over Q squared, and we remove the square root. You do not need to tell me that you square both sides like this. I mean, honestly, if you really, really want to, I get it. That's not bad. 
but every little baby step is not required at this point. Um, just as long as it makes sense, you don't, don't leap to the very end and say, I know it because that's, that's not going to be good enough, but little steps like this are no problem. Uh, I get it. I understand. Okay. Um, and continuing on with this, I want to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply this Q squared to the other side. So two times Q squared is equal to P squared. Okay. I'll write that a little bit better. Okay. So, uh, I have this new statement here and now I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to give you some more proof talk. I guess you can say this is actually all part of the proof here, right here. Um, this statement, this implies that P squared is even. Okay, pause, pause. Why does this imply that the P squared is even? Well, notice that we got two times something, I don't really know what that is, um, equals this guy. Well, two times anything is going to always be an even number. Um, and so let's just kind of do some examples on the side here. Let's just say that I have um, three. Okay, it's just a number. But if I said two times three, I get six. That's even. Okay, what about like, I don't know, five? Well, two times five is ten. That's even. And you're thinking, well, those are easy numbers. What about like four? Well, two times four is eight. Still even. <laughs> And, and you can go through all the stuff. You can even say times zero. It still actually is even. Zero is an even number. Even numbers are uh, basically in the form of two times K. Two times K. I often like to use capital K because my lower is not, not very good looking. But two times K, this is kind of like a definition of even. Just like I would say this is a definition of rational. Okay? They're kind of just basic definitions that we pick up over time. And like the book would show you this stuff too. So I'm saying that this guy here is even because we got two times a number. I don't know what that number is. Yeah, it's squared, but it's just a number. Okay, cool. So we got, you know, this implies that P squared is even. Well, if I have this squared number is even, then I'm also going to say that uh, thus also P is even. Okay. And again, let me just talk about this one. Could you put in some kind of like, um, well, according to the book on page 5 or according to corollary 3.9 or something like that in here? Yes, there's a, there's a lot of these basic things, though, that we don't really have to say that kind of stuff. I'll show you when we will have to reference these outside little proofs or theorems or something like that. But for right now, I'm just going to say, yes, this is also even. Well, let me just kind of prove it on the side and kind of just show you. I'm not going to go through all the little specifics here, but let's say that I had uh, a square number was even. So we had like 16. That's a square number, isn't it? Um, well, then my square root of that is 4. Yeah? So is 4 even? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, you would say, oh, but what about like 25 or something? Well, <laughs> that's not even. That's not my square number is not even. So that's not one of the, it's not a possibility. That, that's not even on my radar. Uh, because I already proved that this was an even number. So um, let's do 36. 36 is an even number, and it's a perfect square, right? Uh, 6 times 6 is 36. So is 6 an even number? Yes. Um, again, though, you could state something in here that says, according to blah, 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 and that's fine sometimes, but other times it's okay. I get the point. We're all okay with this. We we'd see it. You do not need to put this on your paper. This is just me showing you on the side, okay? So we have P is also even as well. Cool. So then I'm going to rewrite P. So I'm going to rewrite P equal to 2K. That's the even definition I had earlier. Um, again, you have to state, since you made up a, a letter here, K element of uh, the integers. Okay. So now I'm just saying, okay, well, if P is uh, even, then it could be rewritten as 2K. Okay, awesome. So then I'm going to go back to my statement then, if that's okay. I had the 2 Q squared is equal to P squared, right? And to the next step, 2 Q squared is now equal to 2K all squared. I just replaced it. I just replaced this little P right here uh, with this guy. Awesome. Well, uh, let me simplify. So I'm going to keep going. Again, I'm just going to the next step. Don't put just a plain equals here. 
just again put an arrow if you put an equals like this statement equals another statement you got a lot of equal signs and it kind of doesn't make sense so uh big arrows are kind of like next next step you know well i would distribute that to there again you don't have to tell me that stuff i just kind of get the idea um that you're distributing to two and then i want to simplify a little bit so i'm going to divide by two on both sides and i got q squared is equal to two k squared okay so now we got this statement right here awesome well, when I'm looking at this statement, this implies that Q squared is even, okay? This implies that the Q squared is also even. Look, it's two times some kind of number, right? Um, thus, also, kind of like repeating myself now, thus, also, Q is even, okay? And this is like the big moment where we're gonna leap into why it's a contradiction and all that kind of stuff. You might be wondering like, well, how did he do this? And why is he doing that? And all that kind of stuff. That's that's kind of the point of proofs is we're looking ahead. I'm kind of wondering how I'm gonna do this. I'm trying some stuff out. Um, and so if it seems like I just created it out of nothing, that's totally true. That's exactly what's going on. Um, there are strategies that are taught through the book in the class, even over the internet, uh, and that's that's okay. So you learn these strategies over time, okay? I'm just showing you what a proof looks like and how to do it. So we have these two statements here. P is even, Q is even, okay? P is even and Q is even. So I'm going to say now, yet P and Q cannot both be even. They cannot both be even. Um, let me go ahead and tell you why. I guess you can use parentheses or something like that. But essentially I'm saying um, they cannot both be even because they would both then have a 2 as a factor. They would then both have 2 as a common factor. Okay, um, but now there's a problem here. Two is a common factor, but go way, way, way back up here so that each have no common factors. Do you see that right there? No common factors, and yet now down here, I'm saying that two is a common factor. Uh-oh, you see how that's the problem. That's, that's the point, though. We're trying to make a contradiction. Um, because it was previously assumed that they had no common factors. And this is where we kind of like break off to some more notation stuff. Often what, we, what I do is I do this big explanation mark thing kind of looks like a big triangle explanation marky thing. This is just what I was taught. It might not be a common thing or not, but that means contradiction. It means contradiction. It's kind of like the contradiction symbol. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to still put that symbol, because that's what I was taught, but I'm going to also write contradiction. Oops. Contradiction. I think I spelled it right. Um, basically, uh-oh, there's a problem. <laughs> That's okay, though. So let's scroll up to the very top here. I want to prove this by contradiction. I want to say, okay, this right here, this guy, is that I'm assuming that it's part of the rationals. Okay? I know it's not, but I'm going to assume this incorrect statement. Okay? I'm assuming an incorrect statement. And then I go through blah, 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 all this math, blah, 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 all this math. And then finally, uh-oh, what I knew was wrong was proven wrong. So that's good. Therefore, therefore, the square root of 2 is definitely not rational. So the only other place, so I'm going to say therefore, the square root of 2 is definitely not rational. So the only other place that it could go is that it's irrational. Thus, it is irrational. And then we 
finish it off with like a period or a box or something like that. I often do the box. And you can fill in your box if you want to. Some people fill it in and make a black box. Uh, either way. But the box basically says you're done. Um, cool. That was fun. I guess some other kind of notation. You could use uh, the three the three dots here for therefore. So like if you wanted to be fancy, you don't have to do this. But like let's just say that we didn't have this here. Kind of like a final statement. Makes it look cool. I'm trying to get all that out of the way. You could just simply say something like three dots, therefore, and then you keep moving. Um, as you keep going through, you'll see these little symbols and stuff pop up all over the place. Um, and so just be prepared for that. Okay. So, again, let's just kind of zoom out for a second here because maybe you're a little confused about why I went down this road. Isn't there another way or something like that? Couldn't I just see, like, look at it? Well, just look at it, man. Yeah, I guess. But that's why the point of proofs is that we have to go through and prove it. It's not just a look at it kind of thing. So, um, I think that should do that proof. We're done there. Uh, what I want to do now is move on to one that we will actually be seeing uh, more. Okay? Like in this class. So, let's do another proof. And then we'll be done with this particular video. So, prove the triangular inequality it's inequality and i'm just going to go ahead and state it for you so that you know obviously because this is the intro you don't really know what this stuff is uh that's a magnitude magnitude double lines magnitude of u vector plus v vector uh is less than or equal to the magnitude of u vector plus the magnitude of V vector. So that is the triangular inequality. And we want to prove that. Um, again, this is, I'm pretty sure, chapter 5.1 in the book. Uh, but I just wanted to show you what it's like to go through uh, one of these kind of things, okay? It's not like you have to learn all of chapters 1, 2, 3, 4 to be able to do this. But it would help, obviously. I'm going to give you all the pointers that you need to be able to get started, though. Okay, so I want to do a graphical approach about what's going on. Always I want to see it before I actually start doing it. And that's just me personally. So on the side, let's talk about what this even means. Let's say that I had um, a U vector and a V vector. Hold on here. U plus V. So we got U vector. We got a V vector. Oops. Okay. And then this one right here, it's kind of an interesting, this is the u plus v vector on the bottom here. Okay. What's going on here is that if you took this vector here and went right here, um, I guess it's we're not looking at the total distance here. I'm just saying from the initial point all the way to the final terminal point, connect those two dots to make the actual u plus v vectors. But if you took those distances individually, it should be equal to or even more than what you originally had. I guess in some special cases is that you have your u vector and then your v vector. You see how it's literally right on top of it? So the total distance is literally equal, the same. Okay. If you have some bend in it, though, then these will always be more individually than where you started from okay so that's the graphical approach and technically there are what i was taught cartoon proofs i guess it would be like a picture proof and this might make sense for that but that's not what we're doing in this class uh there are ways to visually prove things but again not here i'm, I'm doing the words i guess you can say so how do we even start all this here um, we have to kind of know a little bit about vectors and stuff like that. So I'm going to assume that you, you're just going to roll along with me on this. And I'm, I'm just going to give it to you. So here we go. So here we go. I'm going to assume my U and V vectors are elements of the reals at dimension N. N-dimensional real numbers. This is basically a fancy way to say the word vector. 
the word vector. Okay. Again, that's this is my proof over here. This is just my talk about it. So that's just a fancy way to say vector. Um, and that, that's fine. We're going to be learning all this notation as we keep going. Um, by the properties of dot products. Okay, whoa, whoa, hold on. So here's the thing. I went to the book in chapter 5.1, and they actually have a little section in there that says properties of dot products. And they got like, I don't know, five or six of them or something like that. And within that group, I'm going to be using one or two of them uh, to keep going. Notice that I'm telling you it kind of where I'm finding my next step. Like when I, if I just said assume this and I jumped to the next step, sometimes that's okay. But it's also good to just tell me where you're coming from, where you're getting it from. Again, not every time, but it's good to, you know, the more information, the better. So here's one of the properties that was uh, kind of given. I got my u plus v vector magnitude squared is equal to my u plus v vector dot my u plus v vector. Okay. That right there is the dot product. And let me just, if you've not seen the dot product in a while, I mean, I think we did it back in pre-calculus. I could be wrong. But um, let me just kind of real quickly show you. I got like one, two, three dot four, five, six, something kind of like that. Well, the dot product's kind of like multiply, but it's a very particular uh, way. I got this one times the four, two times the five. I'm adding these, plus two times the five, and then plus again, three times the six. So this is what a dot product looks like. We got a four plus a 10 plus an 18. Uh, what would make 32? So we got 32, it's just a number, a single number, uh, and that's fine. But what I wanted to show you was, you know, this is what a dot product is. We're going to learn all that as we keep going through the class. Cool. So how am I going to make this dot product work with these guys here? And so what's going on is I'm having to kind of like I'm foiling it, okay? So again, I would say still according to the properties of dot products and all that stuff, if you go to that page, it kind of shows you some more stuff there. But what you can do here is actually foil this out. I mean, that dot is used for a multiplication symbol because it is a multiplication symbol. We are multiplying. Even though it's not exactly the same multiply, you are still multiplying in the end. And if you notice my style of writing here, I said u times u, u times v, v times u, v times v. I'm just foiling it out, right? I'm just foiling it out. Oil, first in, outer, last, something like that. Anyways, so I just wrote it all out there. Cool. Uh, still according to the properties of dot products. Awesome. So I'm going to keep going. Because the dot product operation, the dot product operator is commutative. Commutative. Then I'm going to say that uh, u dot v is equal to v dot u. Do you have to tell me that it's commutative? No, this is probably um, not a step that you honestly have to do, but I'm giving you more information and I'm showing you cool little words along the way that are important. So you're gonna have to learn a word commutative at some point. Basically, you can flip-flop them. Two plus three is three plus two. And you're thinking, well, doesn't that always work for everything? Uh, no, actually, whenever you're using matrices, and, and surely you remember this back from you know college algebra stuff, A times B is not always the same as B times A. Not just because of its size, but because of numbers and placement, okay? So matrix multiplication is not commutative, but vector dot products are commutative. And so because of that, I'm saying this because I want to put these two together. Okay, so I'm going to say then... Um, I guess you you would say thus the next the statement now is um, you can put extra words in there to make it look cool if you want u dot u oh sorry u dot u u dot v u dot v and v dot v what I did is I just turned these guys around I just turned those guys around right there. 
I know my U's and V's all kind of look the same, sorry. Then I want to combine these two together. Notice that there's two of the same thing. Therefore, what do I do? I simply put a two in the front. Now, I'm going to try to line them up a little bit better. So what I'm... Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and put it in the middle. I was, on my paper, I put it in the end, but either way. Two times this U dot V, because there's... Well, there's two of them. And then we still got, still got the V dot Vs and stuff like that. Okay, awesome. So we're uh, now at this step here uh, where I need to keep using more properties of logs. And so this is kind of like a backwards thing. If you had this statement this way, that's what I'm going to be doing now. I'm saying whatever's on the inside, now I got something dot the same thing, they're the same thing, dot, well then it's the magnitude squared. So it's still under this properties logs. I'm just going backwards for what I just did. So when I say u dot u, that's the magnitude of u squared. V dot v, that's the magnitude of v squared. Still under those properties of dot products. Okay? Cool. So now we're at this step. Now what? Well, if you went back to the book, they actually show you uh, this cool little theorem here. I'm going to say... Uh, by the, I'm probably going to mess up the name, Couchy and Schwarz Inequality. So this is actually in the book. So by this kind of theorem statement stuff, um, probably it's just a theorem, um, and it, I'm going to state it for you. It's the absolute value of u dot v is less than or equal to magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Now this gets a little bit interesting. Normally when I'm trying to multiply two separate numbers, I could put a dot between them. That's just me personally. Um, but if I put a dot here, that would almost imply dot product. And that is not a dot product because these are two separate like numbers, like real numbers. Um, two decimals. <laughs> So, like, maybe you want to do this thing, but then it kind of just looks confusing, too many lines. So often, you just write a whole bunch of vertical lines and call it a day. The print versions of the book base make it look better. Um, it's harder to do all this, you know, writing. Like in the book, they use bold instead of little arrows on top of things. They use bold. Uh, and that's, that's easier for them. I can't bold things when I'm writing. Um, and so I've stated, by this new inequality here, and, and, um, and this is where I kind of did my own talk about stuff here. Uh, and if my u dot v were negative or positive, it also holds that the absolute value of u dot v is greater than or equal to the plain old u dot v. Now again, do you have to say this statement little right here? Well, this is, a, I would say, a borderline yes. This is a borderline yes requirement. I'm just saying here that regardless, and I'm just going to make up some numbers here. Here's my, here's my proof and kind of stuff on the side. If I had a 2 and I took the absolute value of it, well, it's just a 2, so they're equal. But what if I had negative 2 absolute value is now a 2? I want some kind of symbol that always makes sense, I guess you can say. And so I'm saying that the absolute value is always bigger than the original. So is negative is the absolute value of negative 2 is greater than or equal to the negative 2 original? And uh, yeah, it is, because that's going to be a plain old 2. Okay? Or they could be equal. So, again, do you have to state this? <sighs> probably yes but it's not super required this right here this theorem that we're going to be pulling from the book yes you definitely got to say that if you're going to like put this in there somehow you got to tell me where you got it from i don't i don't know how to make that happen i'm not proving that right now i'm using somebody else's proof uh within mine okay so definitely got to say that this one here kind of important and so by this and all this, comma, I'm going to keep saying this huge statement now, uh, together, eh, I'm going to say I get, or 
together we get, uh, together it makes. That's probably better. I mean, it's not an English paper, but you know. Um, I would say my original U dot V is less than or equal to the absolute value of the U dot V, which is less than or equal to the magnitude of U times the magnitude of V. Now notice the alligators. I always say the alligator eats the bigger one. So the alligator's chomp chomping this way on this guy, right? Cool. And now he's chomp chomping this way on that guy. Well, if you line it up from what you have, notice what we have right there. You see it right there? I'm going to convert it over to this guy. Okay? It's like a two-step process. Okay? Um, the statement would now be, and I'm going to go back to the original if that's okay here. So magnitude of u plus v all squared. It was equal to, and I'm just going to write out my, um, my same one here just for clarity's sake. I don't think you have to write what I'm going to write here. But it is a good thing to kind of, you know, for my sake, so I can read it, and you too. So that's my statement. I'm now going to not equals, whoa, 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 be careful right here, be careful. I'm going to now convert it over to a less than or equal to symbol, okay? Because of my alligators right here. So I'm going from here to here now, okay? And I'm going to convert that to an absolute value sign. Okay, so pause for a second. I just said that if this is a negative number right here, then it should be less than this statement here with a positive. If this was a positive to begin with, well, then they're equal, and it's no big deal. But then even further with this couchy, cauchy, Swartz stuff. Is it cauchy? I can't remember. Couchy, cauchy. Um... I'm going to change this now over to the two magnitudes separated. Again, I'm trying not to put a dot between them. I really want to, but that would just be a little confusing in this case. Not that it already isn't confusing. Okay. So we have this new statement here, and this is where we're going to start doing math leaps, I guess you can say. This looks familiar to me. This has a certain style to it. It has a perfect square understanding. And so I'm going to write the step here, and then I'm going to prove it to you, okay? This is technically the magnitude of u squared plus the magnitude of v. No, 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 I'm sorry. I put the square in the wrong place. Magnitude of u plus magnitude of v, and then all squared. I knew there was a square in there somewhere. So what the heck just happened there? Um... Well, let's just say I had x squared plus 2x plus 1, something like that. And I'm like, oh, well, I want to factor this. x plus 1, x plus 1. That's easy. So x plus 1 squared. Notice that I went from this style to here. But notice that I had that 2 in there, right? I doubled it, essentially. I doubled the product of the inside. Well, that stuff right there is just 1 times 1 is 1, essentially. So that's a very basic um, example. But that's the example that we're doing. We're saying, hey, there's a 2 in there. There's a, there's a doubling in the middle. Uh, I've seen this before. It's a perfect square. So that's a perfect square. But now this equal sign here is saying that this statement here is equal to this. Not this. This is not equal to that, okay? This is still has the alligator less than symbols and stuff like that, okay? And so next step, next step, um, I'm going to then say that my u plus v magnitude squared is now less than or equal to my magnitudes separated squared, okay? And, of course, you know the next step after this. I'm going to square root both sides. Get rid of your squares on both sides. Oops. So many vertical lines. Um, again, you might be wondering, well, how do I know that the square root is not going to change that alligator, right? Like, if I did the square root of both sides, will it automatically always be the same? Well, with the, the, the domain and range of a square root function, yes, that's fine. Um, if you were to try to like do like the uh, reciprocal or something like that, 
that would change things. If you were to make one of them negative or something like that, it might change things. So just watch out for that kind of stuff. Uh, but this, the square root of both sides is fine. Well, look what we have here. Let's go all the way back up to the very top, and we finally have what they had. This is it. We got it. We did it. So, um, done. Therefore, done. I, like, you don't even have to put a therefore. We just, there's your statement. Ta-da. You're done. Okay, so those are the two proofs that I wanted to go through. This one's actually more legitimate to this class. The other one was not, but it's a nice little introduction proof. Um, just again, I want I just want to state that a lot of the stuff I'm making up out of thin air. I really am. When you come back here, triangular inequality, and you're looking at this dude, and you're like, okay, where do I get started? I mean, that is that is exactly the hardest moment uh, in these proofs is, okay, I see what the question is. I have an idea about why it works right here, all this stuff, the reasons why it would work, but I don't know how to get started. I don't know how to get started, okay? Same thing up here with this, like, square root 2. So we have um, prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. We're just starting with the statement. How do I go from there? How do I go from there? What is my first step? Well, we have to understand where we're going, what we're doing, and maybe from that we can start doing some math, okay? It's not perfect. It's not pretty. Uh, but that's kind of the point, you know. So if you have any kind of questions, let me know. I'm here to work with you. Uh, thank you for watching this video. And uh, have a great day.